All right, please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter. We're going to be looking at the last verse of this book, closing the book today officially. Title to our message this morning is All Glory Be to Christ. And as you're turning to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, please remember that the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times. So as we hear the words of the Lord today, we are hearing the pure words of the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, we come to you this morning as people who are not existing for ourselves. Lord, we are not at our own disposal, but Father, we exist for you. We are at your disposal. Your word says that the Lord has made everything for himself, and Lord, that includes us. You have made us For yourself, you have made us for your good pleasure, for your glory, to enjoy you, to have fellowship with you forever. And Lord, we know that as we are about to hear your word this morning, that we have many weaknesses, we have many besetting sins, we have many anxieties and distractions and physical ailments. And everything that is coming up against us, Lord, will prevent us from hearing your word with open and soft hearts. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and enlighten the eyes of our heart, that you would come and remind us of the hope that we have been called to, remind us of the glorious inheritance of the riches of the saints, Lord, remind us of the immeasurable greatness of power towards those who believe the same power that you use to raise Christ from the dead is at work in us today. So work in us mightily. Lord, we might hear your voice, that we might be ushered into your presence. Lord, we we plead with you as Moses did. Lord, if you will not go up with us, do not lead us from here. This is a worthless, utterly worthless exercise, Lord, if you do not show up. So we ask for your Holy Spirit and and the power of Christ to come speak your word. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen. All right, please be seated. If you knew the day of your death and you could choose the last words that you were going to speak on planet Earth, what would those words be? What would you say as you draw your final breath? When the reformer John Calvin died in 1564, these were the last words that are recorded. I render thanks to God because he has had compassion on me, his poor creature, to draw me out of the abyss of idolatry in which I was plunged in order to make me a partaker of salvation of which I was altogether unworthy. And continuing his mercy, he has supported me amid so many sins and shortcomings which were such that I well deserved to be rejected by him a hundred thousand times having no other hope nor refuge except in his gratuitous adoption, upon which all my salvation is founded, embracing the grace which he has given me in our Lord Jesus Christ and accepting the merits of his death and passion in order that by this means all my sins may be buried. And praying him so to wash and cleanse me by the blood of this great Redeemer, which has been shed for us poor sinners, that I may appear before his face. Calvin, as he passed from this life to the next, breathed out his very last words in praise of Jesus Christ. 
That is what we see Peter doing here in his last recorded words, in his last letter. To him, to Christ, be the glory to this day, to the day of eternity. Amen. And it's such a peculiar thing that Peter would say this if we were just to consider his circumstances. How could Peter praise Christ under the particular circumstances that he found himself in? He's most likely writing this letter from a Roman prison, in which case he would be separated from his wife and his children. Many of the other apostles have already been murdered. The church was in absolute distress and chaos. In 1 Peter 1, they were being persecuted from without. In 2 Peter, what we see is that they were being persecuted from within from false teachers. Peter lived in a completely pagan culture filled with gross sexual immorality and brutality, just like our culture. How could he have not been filled with despair under those circumstances? And to add to all of this, he knows that he's about to die. And he, know, he, he knows how he's going to die. Jesus predicted it in John 21, 18 through 19. It would be death by crucifixion. I doubt, I doubt anyone hearing my voice this morning is facing those types of circumstances. And yet, astonishingly, Peter says to him, be the glory, both now, in my circumstances, now, and to the day of eternity. Amen. Now, how is that possible? The apostle here is giving us the very essence of the Bible's message in this last verse. The very essence of it. The very heartbeat of Christianity. Yes, it is true that the Bible addresses our problems. Peter has been doing that in this letter, hasn't he? He's been instructing the church how to get along in this present darkness. But the church is not ultimately an institution which is concerned merely or primarily with a discussion of the problems of men and women. Let me say that one more time. The church ultimately is not an institution which is concerned merely or primarily with a discussion of the problems of men and women. The main function and the main business of the church is to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. It's the main function of the church. And this proclamation of Christ is not just the business of the church. It's actually the very breath of the church. It's the very life of the church. This is what we live for. Jesus Christ is not a product that we're peddling. But in him we live and move and have our being. Acts chapter 17, 28 says. He's everything. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. He said, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As the modern, as the modern hymn so aptly puts it, hallelujah, all I have is Christ, hallelujah, Jesus is my life. It's not a slogan for Peter. It's not a Christian t-shirt or a Christian bumper sticker. These last words that Peter spoke was the very heartbeat of his life. Peter all along has been giving us Jesus, hasn't he? At the beginning of his letter, he gave us Christ. Chapter 1, verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In the middle of his letter, he gave us Christ. Chapter 1, verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now at the end of his letter, here in this verse, he gives us Christ again. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. There's no other passion that controlled Peter's life. All along, it's Christ. It was the great singular ambition of his life. 
that all praise, all honor, all glory be Christ's. And that's the challenge for us this morning. What does your Christianity look like? If I were to ask you to finish this sentence, how would you finish it? My life's ambition is... Is what? What do you live for? Why do you exist? That's where Peter is going this morning as he speaks his last recorded words. Here's our big idea this morning. If you're new, this is simply what the message is about. You exist. This world exists so that all glory would be both would be Christ both now and to eternity. You exist, this world exists, so that all glory would be Christ's both now and to eternity. And I could add it on to your everlasting joy. So three parts to our message this morning. First, we're going to see how the glory of Christ is God's highest and best glory. Secondly, we're going to see the glory of Christ is the happiness of Christians. And thirdly, we're going to see how the glory of Christ is to the day of eternity. So first, the glory of Christ is God's highest and best glory. When Peter says here, to him be the glory, what does he mean by glory? My dad and I were in a Bible study here, I don't know what, 12, 13 years ago. We're going over that verse in John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I asked the question, what does glory mean? It was a very foolish question because I didn't know the answer to it. And apparently nobody else in the room knew the answer to it. So there were just crickets. Isn't that amazing? How a word like glory can be totally missed by a room full of Christians. I think we can do the same thing. So... What does Peter mean by glory? Well, there's at least three ways to understand the word glory in Scripture. The first use of glory is the worth of God. The first use of glory is the worth, the internal worth of God. Glory comes from that Hebrew word which means heavy or weighty. C.S. Lewis wrote a book and he captured the meaning and a title to one of his essays. It's called The Weight of Glory. If you remember from the book of Daniel this last year, the evil king Belshazzar was prophesied against. And the prophecy was this, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, Daniel 5, 27. In other words, what God was telling him is you are a light thing. You are an insignificant thing, a despicable thing. You have no real glory. You have no real internal worth to you. He was, if you remember, he was all in his pomp and his wealth and he was boasting about how great he was, but in reality, he was lighter than a feather in God's eyes. He had no glory. But real glory is the infinitely heavy weight of God's internal and eternal worth. This is seen in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18, when Moses cried out to the Lord, he said, Lord, please show me your glory. He wanted to see the worth of God. He was saying, Lord, let me see how worthy you really are. But how did God respond? He said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. What he's saying is that God's internal worth, his glory in this sense is so weighty, it's so heavy that it would crush anyone non-God who sees it. He dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, 1 Timothy 6.16. So that's the first use of the word glory in the scriptures. It's God's infinite worth. But that doesn't seem to line up with the way that Peter's using the word glory. When he says, to him be the glory, it doesn't seem like he's saying, to him be the worth. He's already worth it. We don't add to his worth. So what's the second use of the word glory? Well, the second use of the word glory is the display of God's worth. The second use of glory is the display of God's worth. Now, the relationship between the first use of glory and the second use 
of glory is analogous to our sun in the sky. No one can get near the sun without being consumed. To even look at the sun directly will cause blindness. But the sun does shine its rays. It communicates its brightness or its light for everyone to see. So in this sense, we can see the glory of God. He displays it to us. How? Through the light of creation. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Creation is a window to see the glory of God. Jesus also displayed the glory of God when He performed His miracles here on earth. When He turned the water into wine in John chapter 11, it says that this, the first of His signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and He manifested His glory. He made it known. He displayed it. So this is the second use of glory in the scriptures, the exhibition or the display of God's glory. But again, I don't think that this use seems to line up with Peter's words also. Peter's not saying to him be the display of his worth. So we turn to the third use of the word glory. This is the praising of God's worth. The third use of glory is the praising of God's worth. It is this use of glory that Peter has in mind. So to bring glory to God is simply to praise Him, to honor Him, to delight in Him, to love Him, to desire Him. Psalm 29, 1 through 2. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. That's how Peter is using the word. And it's for this reason, the praise of His name, that God has made all things. God has made everything in this universe to bring praise and honor to His name. God created the universe for His glory. Psalm 8.1, O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. God causes it to rain and to snow so that mankind would see his glory. Job 37, 6 through 7, for to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour, that All men might know that he made it. God called Israel into existence for his glory. Jeremiah 13, 11. I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be a people for my name, for my praise, for my glory. God raised up Pharaoh and judged him. For his glory, Exodus 9.16, but for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Now that is amazing if you remember the Exodus story. God performed 10 plagues on Egypt, obviously showing his omnipotent power. And, And you have to ask yourself, why didn't he just deliver them the very first time? Why through all, why all these plagues? This is the reason. So that he could make his name known in all the earth. Even the saints of old understood this. In fact, the story of David and Goliath. Do you know why David killed Goliath? For God's glory. 1 Samuel 17, 46, he says to Goliath, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. God's glory is what the angels sing about. Luke 2, 14, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with those with whom he is well pleased. God saves Gentiles like you and me. For his glory. Acts chapter 15 verse 14. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles. To take from them a people for his name. Jesus taught us to pray. 
chiefly so that God would get the glory. What's the very first petition in the Lord's Prayer? Matthew 6, verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Praise be to your name. God commands us to do all good works so that God would be glorified. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Everything that God does, without exception, is done for his glory, for his praise, for his honor. That's how Peter is using this word in verse 18 this morning. To him be the praise To him be the honor. But Peter is not talking about the glory of God in general. He's specifically talking about the glory of Christ. That's how verse 17 and verse 18 connect. Verse 17, it says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 18, to him be the glory. To Christ. So he's focusing on Jesus. Why? Why? Why this focus on Christ? Because the highest and best and most decisive display of the glory of God is Jesus Christ. That's what Peter is driving at. Why? Why is that the case? Why is Christ the greatest display of his glory? Well, let's just consider the main works that God has wrought. We can divide them up into three categories. What are the main works that God has wrought? First, there is God's work of creation. And creation is simply breathtaking. Just consider one thing. Perhaps when you go out camping this summer, think about the stars. There are 10 billion galaxies in the observable universe. If we assume 100 billion stars per galaxy, that would mean that there are more than a billion trillion stars just in the observable galaxy, just from what we can see. That's more than all the grains of sand on every beach on planet Earth. And that's just the stars. That's just one thing that he created. Think about something infinitely smaller. Think about your DNA. It's equally astonishing. If we were to take just one strand of DNA from just one cell of your body and stretched it out, it would equal two meters, six feet. If we were to take every strand of DNA from every cell in your body, it would run across the diameter of our solar system twice. But there are countless other things that God has created, things that we haven't even discovered yet. Oh, how God's glory is seen in creation. Secondly, there's the work of God's providence. What is providence? The Catechism tells us God's work of providence are his most holy, wise, powerful, preserving all his creatures and all their actions. Which simply means this. In order for you to stay alive today, this moment... God has to preserve you. God has to preserve you right now. He's holding you together right now. Your heart must keep beating 100,000 times a day without tiring or malfunctioning in order for you to stay alive. Who keeps your heart beating? Are you, are you thinking about that? Heart keep on beating, heart keep on beating, heart keep on beating. What happens when you fall asleep? No, God is keeping your heart beating every moment of the day. He's providentially governing you. It's he who upholds all things together, including your heart, by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3 says. You see, things in nature do not operate on their own. Psalm 147.8.9 said, It's God who covers the earth with clouds. I was barbecuing yesterday. I was just sitting in my chair, just looking at the clouds, and I'm like, Those clouds are there because God covered the earth with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. Think about that next time you mow your yard. God is causing my grass to grow. He gives the beasts their food. The the works of God's providence are simply amazing. 
that are astonishing. In the book of Job, when Job is talking about the power of God and his lightnings and his thunderings, he says, these are just the fringes of his way, just, just the threads hanging off the end of your sleeve. We don't even see we don't even see one percent of what God is capable of doing. But thirdly, there's God's work of redemption, and this is the greatest of all of God's works. There's no greater difficulty in the universe than this work. Each attribute of God is on full display in the work of redemption. Think about God's power. The power to create a billion trillion stars is infinitely easier than the power of God in uniting one who is truly God to one who is truly man. Infinitely easier to create a billion trillion stars than to unite God and man in one person. He's one of a kind. Jesus Christ is one of a kind. Scripture says that there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Think of God's justice. Think of what it took for God's justice to be satisfied in forgiving sinners. It took nothing less than the death of his only beloved son. God treated Jesus. God treated Jesus, the Son of God, as the most vile and wicked sinner when he stood in our stead. That's what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. God treated Jesus like a wicked and vile sinner. Puritan John Flavel imagines what the father said to Christ when he volunteered to be our substitute. Father says to the son, but my son, if thou undertake for them, thou must reckon to pay the last might. Expect no abatements. If I spare them, I will not spare thee. Think of God's holiness on display in redemption. Never has God ever shown his hatred of sin more than on the cross. Think about the judgments in the Old Testament. God was willing to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Egypt and Babylon because he hated sin so much. He even destroyed his own people because he hated sin so much. But never has God's holiness been so manifest as on the cross. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer to that question is that the father was willing to forsake his own son on the cross more than he was willing to forsake his own holiness. By punishing Jesus, God showed that he could never make peace with sin. Next, think of God's wisdom in redemption. Who could have conceived of God dying for sinners? It takes infinitely less wisdom to engineer all the DNA of every living creature than to conceive of a plan that the very person who created the world and gives life to all creatures should be put to death by his own creatures. That's why Colossians 2.3 says that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ is the wisdom of God because nobody could conceive of this plan of saving sinners through the death of God. All of the works of creation and providence look foolish compared to the wisdom it took to conceive of God dying for sinners. Lastly, think of God's love and mercy in the work of redemption. Certainly before God ever sent his son into the world, God has shown his heart of kindness towards mankind. This was one of the things that Paul told the people of Lystra in Acts 14, 17. He says, that, listen, God did good to you. By giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. That's one of the ways that we can witness to people. Look how good God is. God is giving you rain and sun and plants and clothing and relationships. But now, in redemption, God has shown that he can find it in his heart even to love sinners who deserve nothing but his hatred. 
God has given us a greater gift than the angels. You, you realize he did not spare the angels when they sinned? But oh, he has given us a greater gift than, than if he would have given us a thousand worlds. He gave us his only begotten son, not because we deserved it. No, dear saint, if God gave us what we would deserved, we would be damned. God gave us what we didn't deserve. God shows his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The work of Jesus far exceeds the work of creation and providence and every other work of God. This is why Peter says, to him be the glory. All glory be to Christ. Oh, dear saint, consider Peter again as he wrote these words. What a failure he had been in his life. An absolute failure. He denied Christ. He constantly was jockeying for the best position amongst all the other disciples. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Even after he had been restored, what did What did he do? He led the church astray in Galatians chapter 2. He had this track record of a failure. And and yet, here is Christ all along, always forgiving him, always calling him, always restoring him, teaching him, comforting him, always present with him, never forsaking him. That's Christ for you, dear believer. You have made a wreck of your life, every single one of you in this room. Like Calvin said of himself, you should have been rejected by Christ a hundred thousand times. There's never been one day where you have been perfectly faithful to him. And yet he remains perfectly faithful to you. Always. Who is a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over our transgression? You cast all of our sins into the depth of the sea. That's our first point, that the glory of Christ is God's highest and best glory. So let's look secondly at how the glory of Christ is the happiness of all Christians. Glory of Christ is the happiness of all Christians. Now let's just back up for a minute and consider what Peter is doing in verse 18. He's placing Christ at the very center of all things and he's telling us, praise him, honor him, delight in him, not only now but for eternity. In other words, what Peter is doing is he's saying, stop looking at yourselves and look at Christ. Be absorbed in him. Let all of your desires be directed by his desires. That's the very ethic of Christianity. Jesus said, if anyone would come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's the ethic of Christianity, to be absorbed in Christ, to be completely directed with all of our affections at him. And I think that many people reject Christianity on an intellectual level because they they hear that. And they think that this sounds like some form of pantheistic monism. Remember, every worldview has a creation, fall, redemption, glory plot line. In pantheistic monism, the end at which you're aiming at, the glory, if you will, is that you become one with the cosmos. It's to realize that there's no distinctives between your soul and every other thing. And once you achieve this oneness, your consciousness completely disappears and you become absorbed into this non-personal oneness of all things. And I suspect that many non-believers would interpret Peter in this same fashion. In other words, they're, they're hearing, if Christianity means all is for Christ, If Christianity means all glory be to Christ, then where do I fit in? They see this as a disillusion of self. Christianity to them is an emptying of oneself, an emptying of all joy, an emptying of all happiness. I think that's a serious challenge that we have to face. 
C.S. Lewis struggled with something similar to this before he became a Christian. He stumbled at the very idea of Christians praising God. Oh, praise the Lord with me, the psalmist would say. And he looked at that and it was repulsive to him that God would demand our praise. He likened it to a vain woman wanting compliments. But when Lewis was born again, he discovered something very profound about the very nature of praise. He said this, the most obvious fact about praise whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of praise merely in terms of compliment or approval or the giving of honor. I've never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet. Walkers praising the countryside, players their favorite game, praise of weather, wine, dishes, actors, motors, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians and scholars. He was a scholar, of course. Praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. I had not noticed either that Just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The psalmists in telling everyone to praise God are doing what all men do when they speak about what they care about. My whole more general difficulty about the praise of God depended on my absurdly denying to us, as regards the supremely valuable, what we delight to do, what we indeed can't help doing about everything else we value. Now, I know that's a long quote, but what Lewis is saying here is absolutely profound. We can't help praise and rejoice in what we enjoy most. You do it all the time. You praise things that you love. You praise things that you enjoy. The praising of it is the consummation of the joy itself. It's like the joy is not complete until it actually, oh, wasn't that great. And then then there's release. You only praise things that you enjoy. You don't praise tetanus shots. You you don't praise cruel and brutal men. You don't praise unjust laws. No, you only praise those things that you love. And as Lewis says, the worthier the object, the more intense this delight would be. So when the catechism says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, We discover that these two things are the same thing. To enjoy God is to glorify Him. In commanding us to glorify Him, God is inviting us to enjoy Him. It's the same end. I remember, some of you remember our dear sister Lizzie, who has now gone home to be with the Lord. And when she came here, she for the first time, heard this word glory, 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 glory all the time. Um, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And she hadn't been exposed to that type of theology before. And so she asked me one time, Josh, how do you glorify God? She she was, it was a very sincere question. She wanted to know the answer with all earnestness. And I said, Lizzie, good news. You glorify God by simply enjoying him. That's the greatest thing you could do is enjoy him in everything that you do. That is what brings him glory. You see, far from adopting some sort of version of pantheistic monism in which we lose all of our consciousness and all of our personality and all of our happiness, being a Christian means that you have come alive to the most supremely valuable person in all the universe. And the only possible response is praise 
The only possible response is to glory in Christ. That's not losing our distinctiveness. That's not losing our joy. That's becoming awakened to it for the very first time in your life. Let me get at this from a slightly different angle if that was difficult. The one book, more than any other book, that has helped shape my view on God's glory and my happiness is John Piper's Desiring God. If you have not read that book, I would highly commend it to you. Outside of the Bible, I think that was the most important book I've ever read. In that book, I read that my gladness and God's glory are not two opposite things. They're not oil and water. They are hand in glove. And his main thesis was simply this. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. In other words, God's ultimate goal in the world, which is his glory, all those verses we just read, God's ultimate goal in the world and our deepest desire to be happy are one and the same. Therefore, in seeking his own glory, God is seeking our greatest happiness in him. And the Bible is full of verses where we see God pursuing his own praise and pursuing our own pleasure at the same time. Listen to what the psalmist says. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Do you think God is praised when you delight yourself in him? And what do you get? The desires of your heart. Psalm 1611, you made known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's one of the most precious verses. But let me ask you, would God be praiseworthy if the verse were to say, in your presence is boredom and misery forevermore? No, God would not be praised. No, in telling us that in God's presence is all pleasure, he's telling us that God is all praiseworthy. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 43, 4, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you, O God, my God. You see, the praise of God and our pleasure are not two ends. They are one end. When Peter is telling us to glory in Christ, to praise Christ here at the end of 2 Peter 3, he's telling us, find all your pleasure in him, all your delight in him, all your happiness in him. That's our second point. That the glory or praise of Christ is the Christian's highest happiness. So let's look lastly at our third point. The glory of Christ is to the day of eternity. Now, Peter is calling us to a type of life in this verse. He's calling us to a life of glorying in Christ. He says, both now and to the day of eternity. So there's actually a duty in this doxology. And so the question here this morning is this. Are you living for the glory of Christ? Are you concerned about his glory? Are you, are you desiring to promote his glory in your, your relationships, at your work, in church, in your private life? Now, there's no doubt that if you're a Christian, that if you've been born again, regardless of where you're at right now, you are deeply concerned with God's glory. It's impossible for you to not be. But often, you and I fail to bring glory to Christ in our life. Perhaps you're limping along from Sunday to Sunday and your days in between don't feel very much like they have Christ in them at all. What should you do? Where should you go? Well, let's ask a diagnostic question. Why do we fail in glorying in Christ? Why do we fail to enjoy Him so? I want to offer you three reasons why Christians often fail 
to glory in Christ. The first reason that you and I can fail in glorying in Christ is because we've forgotten the gospel. The first reason that we fail in glorying in Christ is because we've forgotten the gospel. And you will not glory in Christ. You will not enjoy Jesus if you've forgotten what he has done for you. And I know right away some of you are going to pass this off because it sounds so ridiculous. How can I forget the gospel? I know John 3.16. I go to a gospel preaching church. I listen to Christian music. I know the gospel. Yes, very well. But you see, there's, there's such a thing as knowing the gospel and forgetting the gospel at the same time. And what I mean by that is this, is that you can know the facts of the gospel in your head, but you can fail to transfer the truths of the gospel to your heart. Isn't that how we all come in on Sunday morning? Do a little interview at the door. You could all give us the facts of the gospel. And what do you need? You need the truths of the gospel brought down to your heart. And all of us do this. In order to really glory in Christ, in order to really enjoy Him, you don't need to remember what He has done. You need to remember what He has done for you. You, you were born in sin. You, you have broken all of God's laws. James 2.10 says that if you're guilty of one of God's laws, you're guilty of the whole law. You were a child of wrath. You were wretched and doomed and damned beyond death on your own. That, that was you. That's it's who you were. But Jesus has given you a new life. Jesus has delivered you from the wretched, unhappy life of sin and self-worship and bondage. Jesus has rescued you from the certain judgment of God. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus reconciled you to the Father. Jesus brought you into the kingdom of God. Jesus has promised you that nothing can separate you from the love of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What happens if you were to start rehearsing that in your heart? Brothers and sisters, I have to do that all the time. All the time. When you start rehearsing those truths in your heart, when you start applying them to yourself, what will happen? What will you naturally do? Joy, glory, praise, enjoyment of who? Of Jesus. You will naturally praise him. They will, those facts will cease being impersonal and they'll become infinitely precious to your heart. You will glory in Christ. That's the first reason why we fail to glory in Christ. Because we forget the gospel. We forget what it means down here. The second reason that you can fail in glorying in Christ is because you have idols. The second reason that you can fail to glory in Christ is because you have idols. Now, it's true that when you were born again, something very fundamental happened to you. As 1 Thessalonians 1.9 says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So Christians no longer have the same relationship with idols as unbelievers do. Yet, just like the children of Israel constantly wanted to return to Egypt, so Christians often desire to return to those idols. The apostles knew that this was an ever-present temptation. John, in the very last verse in his first letter, 1 John 5, 21, what did he say? He said, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Idolatry. The worship of other things, 
will keep you from glorying in Jesus. They will keep you from enjoying Him, from praising Him, from honoring Him. So how do you know if, you, how do you know if you're serving idols? Well, if you're alive, you're probably at least serving one or two. Let's just start there. Jimmy Needham wrote a, a song entitled Clear the Stage. Arnie Elmore turned this on to me in our prayer breakfast a couple weeks ago. Such a wonderful song. And it exposes idols by asking some very, you know, soul-exposing questions. So here's the climax of the song. He says, anything I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all of my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking of is an idol. Anything that I give all of my love to is an idol. So examine your heart. What are you putting before Christ? What do you want with all of your heart? What are the things that you can't stop thinking about? What do you give all of your love to? Whatever those things are, they're stopping you from glorying in Christ. Or let me put it another way. If you aren't glorying in Christ, then you most certainly have idols. You see, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and, des- and despise the other. That's why Christians who pursue idolatry are the most miserable type of people. That's why they're the most discontented. If you try to share the glory of Jesus with other masters in your life, you will end up not being able to enjoy either. That's the second reason why we fail to glory in Christ, because we have idols. The third reason, the last reason that you can often fail in glorying in Christ is because you don't consider your future state. Third reason you fail to glory in Christ is because you don't consider your future state. Notice how Peter says in our verse, to him be the glory both now, we've been dealing with that, and to the day of eternity. Consider the whole of Peter's letter. What has he been spending his time teaching us? He's been spending his time teaching us about the end of the age. Peter's been completely consumed with what the return of Christ will be like. Not, he, he's not concerned about eschatology charts. He's not concerned about worthless speculation. No, he's concerned about Christ. And he's calling us again and again and again to consider him and to think about these same things. In fact, this is the message of the New Testament itself. It's constantly reminding us to look to the return of the king. This is how Paul encouraged the Thessalonians during the persecution of their day. He said, for this, speaking to the Thessalonian church, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, but the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the shout of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpets of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words, is what Paul says. You see, focusing on our future state helps us to glory in Christ. That just proved it. You guys said amen. You said amen after you got a glimpse of future glory. That's what your soul needs. When we focus on our future state, we're reminded that this is not all that there is. Why do you think that there's so much despair in the world today? Why do you think suicide is so prevalent? Because people are realizing that if this is all there is, then this life is not worth living. And they're right. But this is not all there is. Christ is coming back. And he will take a hold of you. 
so that where he is, so you shall also be. Oh, dear saint, you must grab a hold of that truth. The only way to live in the present is to consider the future. Consider one day that all evil will be vanquished. The devil will be thrown into the lake of fire. Consider that day when your constitution will be so changed that you will never face temptation again. You will never sin again. You will never feel pain again. You will never weep again except for joy. As Revelation 22, 4 through 5 says, you will see his face. Night will be no more. The redeemed will not need a lamp or a sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And nothing can stop that. Not bombs, not bullets, not politicians, not presidents, not cancer, not civil war. No one can prevent the return of the king. That's the third reason why we often fail in glorying in Christ because we don't consider our future state. Now, maybe you're here this morning, and you've never prized or praised Jesus Christ, ever. Well, that means you're still living for yourself. That means that when Jesus returns, you will have to give an account for why you thought that he was unworthy to worship. And the Bible says that on that day, the books will be opened, and everyone will be judged according to what they have done. But friend, if you have never loved Jesus Christ, then you have never done anything good in your life. If you've never placed your faith in him, you've never done anything that is praiseworthy. So repent. Turn away from living for yourself. Turn away from glorying in that small world of self and sin. Turn to the living God. Turn to Christ. He will welcome you into his kingdom because he loves sinners. Listen to what John 5.19 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Believe in him this morning. Trust in him. Be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Now, dear church, as we close... In our last message of 2 Peter 2, I want to bring us back to the question that I asked at the beginning. If you knew the day of your death and you were able to choose the last words that you're going to speak on planet Earth, what would those words be? These were Peter's last words. His one focus was Christ, the Son of God who suffered for him, the one who made satisfaction for sin on his behalf. And not just on his behalf, on our behalf. He died in order to make propitiation for our sins. He rose for our justification. He is at the right hand of God making intercession and he will return in glory and bring us into his everlasting kingdom. That's why Peter can say, to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Dear Father, Lord, we just first ask that you would forgive us for putting anything above the glory of your Son, for putting anything in creation, Lord, those things that you created to display your glory, for treating those things as selfish ends to gratify our own lusts. For neglecting, Lord, the works of providence that, Lord, you are holding us together. You're giving us every breath so that we could praise you. And yet, Lord, oftentimes we find ourselves praising ourselves. And yet, Lord, we pray and, and Lord, we also pray that you would forgive us for neglecting in our hearts and our minds so great of work as you have accomplished in redemption by sending your only son. You did not do that for the angels, but you have done that for us. So, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us. And we know that in Christ you have. Help us to live for you. Help us to to cut down any idols that are in our life. Help us to rehearse the gospel to ourselves. Help us to remember our future state. And help us to go out from this place, Lord, and bring glory to you. Bring glory to your Son in everything that we do. We ask these things for Christ's sake. 